Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning. It's so glad, glad to see everybody, and we would like to have a, a record of your presence this morning. If you would sign the attendance pads and pass them, we'd appreciate it. I want to welcome those of you joining us on YouTube online, and we're glad you're worshiping with us. Please hit the like button and the share button and pass this on to your friends. We have several announcements this morning with uh, various things coming up. First of all, please continue the last few days of our Epiphany prayer guide for our ministers and leaders. We just have a couple of days left, but uh, hopefully you will just pray ourselves all the way through Epiphany and hope that you will uh, participate in that. Beginning this Wednesday is a change of season. It is Ash Wednesday. We will have two services with the historic imposition of the ashes on the forehead coupled with prayers and devotion. We'll be doing that in the chapel. We'll do one on Wednesday just a little bit after the noon hour, like 1210 to 1240. If uh, there are people who are working, that will give them a chance to come and then give them plenty of time to get back to work. That evening, let me ask Jim, is the choir going to meet at 630? Then we'll do our second service from 6 to 6.20. So those of you in the choir can also participate, and we'll finish at 6.20 and give you opportunity to be off to choir. When we launch the season of Lent, we will also launch our Help Change the World campaign. I don't know if uh, these uh, guides, giving guides, were passed out this morning. I know there are some in the back. Uh, so they are passed out. This will show you some of our goals for this year. And we will have coin jars, big coin jars, uh, throughout the church. And it's just simply a way that people of every age, even the children can come and, and bring their change. Or if you have change, put that in the jar and all of the change will go specifically to focus on these what are called connectional opportunities during this campaign, which you can see at the bottom part of the page. Of course, uh, more than coins can be placed in there. You can place bills or a check. And uh, uh, especially as we come to the end of the Lenten season and go towards Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday, uh, all of the offering for Monday, Thursday will go to this Change the World campaign. When we look at our connectional opportunities, if you total those all up, it's just a little over $8,000. I'm just lifting this up as a matter of prayer and thought. Wouldn't it be wonderful come Easter morning if we could uh, submit one half of that uh, on Easter, uh, the, the week after Easter, and already this year pay off one half of what are called our connectional opportunities because all of those go directly then are forwarded on to those ministries and help them uh, in their projects. But anyway... Uh, change the world. We'll have the change jars out starting Wednesday. Uh, just be generous during this time. All of these go to very uh, needy and specific causes. I did receive one notice before the service began. Uh, I do not know this individual, but many in the congregation, I'm assuming, will. The announcement that Wade Van Winkle passed away Friday, February 25th in Oklahoma City says Wade uh, was the son of George and Nancy Van Winkle. His funeral is scheduled for Saturday, March 5th at 11 o'clock at the Vondell Smith South Lake Funeral Home in Oklahoma City, and he is survived by his wife Susan Van Winkle, who is the daughter of Dick and Gretchen White. So I'm sure many of you uh, through the Sepulpa community are familiar with this family and situation. And we will post this information outside the church office in case you need to write that down or, or need the name of the funeral home or anything like that. I also want to say that uh, we have been in kind of a journey with the United Methodist Church, and that's an ongoing journey. There's supposed to be, at some point, a general conference, which is actually to vote on a proposal known as the Protocol which, if passed, would effectively divide uh, what we know now as the United Methodist Church into two, possibly three, different denominations. It was proposed that that be voted on at a specially called General Conference. Uh, it's the last part of August, the first part of September, so you can either say August or September. 
Uh, it has not yet been officially announced whether that event is going to happen or whether it will be postponed. I'm hearing rumors about that, but until an official announcement is made, I'm not going to comment on that. Other than to say, I received an email from our bishop with a link to a video that he and other conference officers have produced that he wants uh, displayed or viewed by every congregation. And so I'm going to honor that request. On Sunday, March 13th at 3.30, we will gather those who are interested here in the sanctuary. We will simply together watch the video, which is, I'll say, 35 to 40 minutes in length. And then following that video, we will have, uh, I'll answer questions as best I can and have discussion. I do want you to know that this is an informational meeting. It is not a meeting when any proposals will be considered or votes taken or anything like that. It is strictly honoring the bishop's request to show this video to members of the congregation in which he updates us. Now, some of you, I am aware, also received an email from the bishop with a link inviting you to a webinar that he is hosting tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. I do not know who all received that or how he chose who he sent that invitation out to. I did receive it, and I know other members of the congregation have received it, but uh, what list he was sending that out to, I don't know. But there was a distinct distinction <laughs> between that email and the other one. In the one, he clearly said, share this with the congregation. In the webinar for tomorrow night, he did not. And I've had people ask me, uh, can they join that or be forwarded? Since the bishop did not specifically ask us to share that information or that link, I do not feel led or free to do that. If you receive the invitation and link, then I would encourage you to hit the link, sign on at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. How much what he's going to share there is different from what you will see in the video on the 13th. I really have no idea. But that is the situation. But I do want to say that everybody is invited on Sunday afternoon the 13th at 3.30. We'll just watch the video. And again, it's informational in nature. He answers some questions and is interviewed by some members of what are called the denominational transition team. And it just will kind of update us. And I also anticipate by the 13th that there will be an official announcement as to whether or not general conference will be held in August of 2022 this year, or whether that is going to be postponed uh, to, the, to the regular general conference year of 2024. And at this point, I'm going to wait until I hear it directly from the source before I uh, speculate or pass along rumors that I have heard. So with that exciting news, I know we have a couple of announcements, and we'll start uh, with Sherry and April and uh, Christy and uh, Heather, you also have one. You want to go last? Heather's got a big concluding event for us, so we'll let her. We'll let her go last. Okay, I'll try to talk fast. I got on the engine of the train here. Okay, um, so once again, I'm up here to um, share with you about our spring break VBS opportunity. Um, we had a phone call from Salvation Army this last week wanting to up their numbers of the kids who are coming from 30 to 45. So I'm really, really excited about that opportunity. I've been in contact with Alan Bowden. They've got some students that they really think will benefit from a program where you just get loved on and learn about Jesus. So I'm really, really excited to see what God's going to do. A little nervous because <laughs> we, need, we need bodies. So um, if, if you could just pray and consider about a way that you might be able to help. I know it's during the week. I know a lot of you work. Um, but, or at least, just, at least just pray for us. Pray for the kids who are coming. Pray for the families who are going to be touched. Um, today I put out a little jar at the back. Um, it's a t-shirt. But normally I like to do fun t-shirts for VBS. You know, it's kind of like, like a little fun little memento. They're kind of pricey. But I was praying about it. And, you know, I just figured, you know, this time since it's a beach theme, why don't we do tie-dye t-shirts? And that way, each child can make their own unique creation as a reminder that they are God's own unique creation. 
So we've got all the we've got all the stuff except the t-shirts. So if you got some spare change you can drop in the bucket. We can go to Michael's and buy those two dollar t-shirts and everybody can make your own design and we can all wear them on Thursday. I'll take a picture so everybody can see. But um, you know, just just remember, you know, this VBS isn't just an event and just get bodies in the seats. We're sharing the love of God. And I want these kids to be able to take something home with them that they're going to remember forever. Okay. Thank you. Happy Mardi Gras, almost. <laughs> If you'd like Mardi Gras beads, they're on the table in the library. Take them until they're all gone. I have two announcements. One, Faithlings class, which meets in the library, will be starting this book, this study, Give Up Something Bad for Lent. If you'd like to uh, meet with our class through that time, feel free to join us and grab a book off the table. We can always get some more books. The next thing is that the young adult class uh, we'll be doing a restart again uh, next Sunday. Uh, they're going to be working on a different material, but they're looking forward to, Kimberly's looking forward to welcoming everybody back uh, for that class. It is in the third room on the left, on the, uh, well, it's the West Hall, if you're directional, not directionally challenged like some folks. Uh, but we'd love to have you. It's, if you think you're one of the young adults, you are. <laughs> well, I'm about to fall down up here. Um, I'm excited to tell you that our women's group will be starting a new study. It's a second book in a series, a three-book series. It's called The Apprentice Series. And it's called The Good and Beautiful Life by James Bryan Smith. I agreed to do this because it is very much something that gets us in God's word and praying every day. That, that was my goal. And I chose this scripture. We actually had it in Sunday school this morning. That uh, it's Romans 12. Verse 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. He is a good God, and we want to follow him. We want to be with him. In this book... Um, he says, I'm going to just read two things. I believe that the key to beginning a good and beautiful life is to adopt the narratives of Jesus. I fell in love with the God, the God Jesus knows, and I began to see myself as someone in whom Christ dwells as sacred and valuable. I started to treat people differently as I entered the kingdom and learn that I really can pray for my enemies and bless those who curse me. And then he goes on to say several other things. The goal is that we might be transformed by the love of God and by Jesus. I think you would really love the book, and if this is a good time for you to study this with us, we meet Wednesdays at 315 in the library, and we would love to have you come. Thank you. Just real quick, the Methodist men's going to meet Thursday noon for lunch downstairs. Does any of you guys want to show up? Appreciate having you. First of all, I just want to put a plug in for Sherry and the program she's developing for the youth, not only of our church, but of this whole community. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, from my Boy Scout days, I'm used to soliciting help. <laughs> so 
I will say, if you can even just spare one day during that week of spring break, or two, or the whole week, if you can spare some time to help her reach these children with the plans and the hopes that she has for them, I really hope you will consider doing that. And then to continue our marathon of announcements today, <laughs> I'm just here to invite you to an event the first Sunday in April and to get you excited and stimulate some interest and to encourage you all to come. Now, I think you all know the children's song. Father Abraham had many sons. Many Father sons, sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. The whole point of us singing that song today is to prove that we are all of the same heritage, even back through the Jewish nation, clear back to Abraham. And through them, we received our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a lady, her name is Martha Zimmerman. She's a Christian author and speaker who wrote a very interesting book called Celebrating Biblical Feasts. And she writes about the New Testament significance of Old Testament celebrations. And some of the comments, like on the back of the book, she connects us with our Jewish heritage and revives our participation in the same celebrative meals that Jesus ate and enjoyed. We as Christians can participate in these rich celebrations that were important to Jesus. We can come to understand their significance for us as Christians and discover the powerful spiritual truths that they offer. And so that is exactly what the Messianic Rabbi Jack Zimmerman does when he leads a Passover meal. And I know we've hosted those a couple of times in the past. We're going to do so again on Sunday, April 3rd at 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, Messianic Rabbi Jack Zimmerman will be leading us as we experience and celebrate the history, the tradition, and deep spiritual significance of the Passover meal that was celebrated by the Israelites and is to this day. And it began with their exodus from Egypt. Passover was a celebration, a remembrance, a thanksgiving, and participation in God's mighty acts of salvation for his people. But reliving the Exodus is not just about remembering an event long ago. It's about participating in a conversation that provides hope and strength for the struggle to make our days a brighter day, our tomorrows a brighter day. Um, Jesus celebrated the Passover during his lifetime as the ultimate act of God's redemption and affirmation for the Israelites as his chosen people. But he celebrated his last Passover the night before, before becoming our sacrificial Passover lamb. Today we know that the great delivery of the Exodus was a foreshadowing of God's ultimate plan of redemption for all people. There is so much to learn about the Passover. I've, I've been through it with Rabbi Jack two or three times now, and I keep reading, and I feel like I learn something new every time I open a book about it or celebrate with Rabbi Jack. <clears throat> and he will have so much more to share with us and teach us. So I hope you'll hold Sunday, April 3rd at 4.30 p.m. open for us to come together and celebrate. We'll have sign-ups in the narthex over the next few Sundays for everyone to put down your names <clears throat> and how many guests you want to bring. This is just so that we'll know how many tables to set up and then how, many, uh, how much food to prepare. So again, that's April 3rd. Sunday at 4.30 in the afternoon. We look forward to celebrating together. I do want to mention we're going to have a very brief meeting of the finance committee uh, after church in the parlor. Please join us if you're on that committee. We'll invite Cabe to come up, who has made it back safely uh, from Israel. Uh, one note of update and correction. It was last week when uh, I asked Sherry if she had heard from Cabe, and he, she said, I have a picture of Cabe and Claire that they sent me, and they are in France. And I said, what? I said, did they elope? And uh, in fact, they did not elope. That picture was taken at a French restaurant in Israel. And when Claire <laughs> sent that to Sherry, she said, here we are in France, which led to all kinds of uh, uh, confusion. But anyway, Cabe, we are glad you're back safe and sound and uh, sorry for the confusion on that but uh, let's have the congregation stand as it leads us now in our call to worship 
pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed with me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior, and my God. By opening our opening hymn is number 451. Please remain standing as we share in our prayer of confession and praise. Almighty and everlasting God, ruler of heaven and earth, forgive us of our sin, hear our prayer, and give us your peace now and forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God's peace be with you. I think for one more week we'll do the holy wave and then maybe go back to the passing of the peace. So let everybody know, glad they're here this morning. And the congregation may be seated and Terry and Jim will lead us in our, our songs of praise.
Please join with me in prayer. Lord God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson is from 2 Corinthians 5. Please remain standing. Kay will come and share that with us. This is chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for them who died for them and was raised again. This is the word of God for the people of God. Um, if you'd like to stand and sing with us, feel free, but you don't have to.
Really appreciate it. Continuing in our series on our life in Christ, and we've looked at so many different aspects of this, what it means to live our life built upon Christ, our solid rock, and to live in Christ under the authority of Christ, with Christ who is with us in every stage and storm of life, and unto Christ. And today we look at the word for. What does it mean to live for Christ? Because when we focus on the word for, it has to do with our motive. It has to do with our motivation and our heart's desire. And there's a verse which Kay bred for us today, which is powerful. It's it's 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, when it says, For Christ's love compels us. What does it mean for us to live for Christ in such a way that we embrace his love and that his love actually compels us. And what is the scope or the significance of that? Well, so many things come to my mind and so many passages come to my mind. I want to just share some of them with you this morning, and you may have others as you think about the application to yourself. One, evidenced by our praise team, the love of Christ, I think, compels us to praise. Next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the uh, story of the triumphant entry. You remember that? And the disciples came in. They were praising God and celebrating, and some didn't like that. And they said, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, if they be quiet, even these stones will cry out. There's something built within us to praise God. I've wondered why that's so powerful and so important in our life, and I think... It has the effect of refocusing our sight. When we're praising God, it takes our vision off of our problems over which we have no problem really to deal with or change and focuses us now on the person of God who has tremendous power to intervene and change our circumstances in our life. And when we love God, there's something within us that just has to celebrate and praise God. And it's hard to sing a song like the praise team just shared without either standing or clapping or just singing along or being caught up in it because our hearts are meant for praise and the byproduct of that is God's love fills our hearts even more and we are compelled to praise the Lord. Think of another passage, and there's two parallel passages, one in Luke chapter 7 and one in John 12. One is the story of a sinful woman who comes in and anoints the feet of Jesus, kneels at his feet and anoints him. And the disciples say, doesn't he know who this is, the sinful woman anointing his feet? And then the other is the story of Mary who comes in, and and in that case they're grumbling and say, doesn't she realize that that alabaster jar could have been sold for a wonderful price and the money given to the poor. And Jesus makes it very clear that the reason the sinful woman's anointing her feet is because she was embraced by the love of God. She had been forgiven so much. And he even asked the disciples, if someone's forgiven 500 denarii and someone's forgiven 50 denarii, who, who is going to love more? And they said, well, the one who's been forgiven the most. And that is true, that... There's something about the love of Christ and receiving and embracing the love of Christ that causes us to worship and to fall on our knees before Christ in thanksgiving for the forgiveness he's given us. There's something about the love of Christ that causes us to bring the best we have and to give the most that we have and to bring it to him just for his honor and his work. And the love of Christ in both cases compels us to worship him and be thankful for the forgiveness we've received and to give of our best to serve him. On Lent, we're going to start this Change the World offering. We do it every year. Sounds kind of trivial when you just uh, throw your change into a jar until it adds up. And then others give more substantial gifts, and then we send this money off to various causes that are touching lives of children 
who are in homes and under the guidance of the circle of care because they have no home. And it touches the lives of those who are in rehabilitation centers because they've become afflicted with addictions in their life. And it touches the lives of those who have come out of prison or are being ministered to the prison and their life is being turned around. And for the first time, they have a chance of, of a new life and becoming productive members of society. And when we see that the love of Christ compels us to be a part of giving to serve others and to help change our world, that it's not just change in a jar, it really is an offering of the heart that literally helps change our world. And a part of this comes out of a deep gratitude and a realization that we've not been perfect either, that many of us have sinned in many ways and God has forgiven us. And in most cases, God has given up, forgiven us in a great measure. And so we worship him and we bow before him and we give of ourselves and we give of our possessions that his love might be known by others as well. Then I think of the passage in Acts chapter 4 where a, a lame man was healed. And Peter and John are preaching the resurrection of Christ and announcing the great power of Jesus and the officials of the Jews didn't like that. And they arrest Peter and John and they bring them in uh, to their council and they continue to witness to the power of Jesus. And what are we going to do with these people? Uh, the crowds are following them. Here we have this lame man. He's been healed. There's no denying that, no doubting that. And someone says, let's just warn them. Let's just threaten them and send them on their way. And so they say, we're going to let you go, but on this condition, we don't want to hear any more preaching or teaching or testifying about this person, Jesus, and what he does. And, and Peter and John respond by saying, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to pay attention to what you say, or whether it's right for us to pay attention to what God says, you can be the judge of that. But he says, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. The love of Christ, they are saying, compels us to tell the story of Jesus, which we have seen and heard. You know, we think of witnessing as sometimes a difficult thing and something that's hard to engage in and something we're not sure we can do. But in essence, it's just us telling the story of what we've seen Jesus do in our life. It's just us sharing the story of what we've heard about what Jesus has done in the lives of others. I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and he said, this is kind of remarkable. We've been in touch with a, a Russian individual, a lady, who we became acquainted with through our family. She gave her life to Christ through the ministry of Billy Joe Doherty. Some of you know the founder of the Victory Church here in Tulsa. When Billy Joe was on an evangelism crusade over in Russia, and she shared now how at this crucial time in the history of our world, how she and other Christians in Russia are praying that this issue be resolved and praying that there will be a change of leadership and mindset among the leaders of their country. Lives who are touched because someone shared the gospel with them and now they cannot help. They said, even though it's dangerous, we are witnessing and telling the story of Jesus, even though conflict has broken out and wars and rumors of wars are on all of our minds. Shared with you the story several years ago of a funeral I attended by a man, and I'd known this man for some time. I didn't know his whole history, but I learned at his funeral that he had given his life to Christ while in a prison. I knew him as a car owner, a used car lot dealer. His name was Roy, <clears throat> but he had a dramatic conversion, giving of his life to Christ while in Leavenworth Prison. And his life was changed. They finally, they wanted to, the, the officials wanted to parole him. They said he spends all his time preaching here. We need to get him. Uh, they were getting annoyed with all the preaching and testifying he was doing in the prison. He went out and started his own car lot in Oklahoma City. And it was said that not everyone who uh, went on his car lot bought a car. But everyone who visited his car lot heard the name of Jesus. Because he could not help 
but tell. He was compelled to share with others what he had seen and heard and what the Lord had done for him. I think of the passage in 1 John where we have these words, we love because he first loved us. If we say we love God and yet hate our brother, we are liars. If we do not love a fellow believer whom we have seen, we cannot love God whom we have not seen. He has given us this command. Those who love God must love one another. The the love of God, as we grow in the love of God, the love of God compels us to love and serve others. I I don't know about you. I'm just being honest this, this morning. A lot of the emotions that have taken place by world events over the last several days, my heart is broken. There have been times when I've been brought to tears watching the stories of what's going on in Ukraine. And the thought, how can we help these people? How, how can we help our brothers and sisters around the world? How can we help Christians caught in the midst of this terrible situation, both in Ukraine and in Russia? Some under threat in Poland and other parts of the world. And my only thought is there's going to come a time when the doors are opened in very practical ways for us to respond and do what we can. And at this time, it may be as only prayer, but there's going to be times, there's going to be mission groups. And how many times did you, did you go in mission to Ukraine? Four, five times? You know, we may need to hear more about that during this Lenten season and, and some of the, your perspective over there. But there, there's going to be any time there are circumstances in the world where there are people in devastation and need, eventually God opens doors of service and ways to respond, and we need to be ready. We, we need to be ready, and for some of us it may be financially, for some of us it may only be prayer, for some of us it may be actually going on a VIM trip or some kind of mission trip, that the time is going to eventually come, but right now how we need to pray for our brothers and sisters in our world situation, because the love of God compels us. It's interesting when you watch and read through the passages of Jesus, there's a kind of a sequence of phrases where it says Jesus saw, and then Jesus was moved to compassion, and then Jesus acted. We see that sequence again and again and again. He sees the hungry who are like a sheep without a shepherd and moved with compassion. And then he feeds the 5,000 and we see that pattern repeated. It's a pattern for us. We first, as we see these images of what's going on around the world and in some cases on our own country, and then out of love for God, allowing him to fill our hearts with compassion and then discerning how can we be a part of loving and ministering to and serving them. Then finally, I would, I would suggest this morning that the love of God compels us to obedience. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That part of our keeping the commandments of Christ is just simply following. It's, it's an outflow of our love for him. We don't do it under threat. We don't do it under bribery. We don't do it with some carrot attached or with some dread of punishment attached. We just do it out of love of the one who deeply loves us. We want to serve and love him. And uh, there's a little, I thought about doing that little chorus this morning. Uh, The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. I want to love him more. I want to love him more. And And it goes on in the other verses, out of that great love, the greatest thing in all my life is serving you. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. I want to serve you more. And you can add the phrases, the greatest thing in all my life is just obeying you. And following in Christ's teaching and following in his way. And I know for you, you can probably think of other passages or in your own life other ways in which the love of Christ compels you this morning to some manner of thinking, to some manner of praying, to some manner of acting, to some 
manner of giving, but when we think of this phrase, our love for Christ, <clears throat> or living for Christ, it raises a question, and it, this is a great question to launch us into Lent. Maybe we'll look at this more at our, our Lenten imposition of the ashes services this Wednesday. It launches us into a question. Who are we primarily living for? Who, who, who in our life are we primarily living for? Some would say for their spouse. That's a wonderful and noble cause. Some would say for their children. I am living my life for my children. And, and that is a noble, noble cause. Some would say for their family. Nothing wrong with that. I hope all of that is true. But I hope at the deepest levels of our heart, at the deepest levels of our life, we can say, I am living for Christ. Because when we are living for him, he compels us in our love for our spouse. He compels us to live an appropriate life for our family. He compels us to love our brothers and sisters in need and to respond uh, in appropriate ways. He compels us to live in a spirit of praise. And he compels us to share what we have seen and heard so that others might come to the point where they live for him as well. Thanks be to God. Amen. joys and concerns this morning, uh, flowers given this morning in celebration of Jeff Kilpatrick's birthday given by Linda Holman. Don't see Jeff, he finally hit 40, so good for him. <laughs> Others uh, this morning with a joy, a note of celebration they would like to share. Any particular joys? Are you seeing a hand? Robert's pointing me to somebody. I don't know who he's pointing me to. Gary Gloden. Hey, good to see you there, buddy. Good to have you back. Yes, Christy. It's a joy to have children in the children's department. All right. Amen. And if you'd like to share in a whole bunch of joy, uh, sign up for VBS because we've got 40 or 50 kids coming to that. We need, uh, we need a lot of joy-filled people. Hey, good to have you back, brother. How are you doing? So good to see you. Thank you. Any others with a celebration or a joy? Uh, oh, yes, Ann. Well, I put away the fruit from the uh, lunchbox pantry. 
Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Special concerns, Sally, we understand you've lost a, a loved one, a sister, and our condolences to you. Is a service scheduled of remembrance or? Be next Saturday, okay. Our thoughts and prayers with you and your family. Uh, others, uh, both of my grandchildren, one is recovering and one has just come down with the flu. Apparently that's going around now. So we, we get COVID on the downslide. Now we've apparently got the flu uh, bobbing up here and there. And certainly we need to pray for our world situation um, don't know when I've seen such a serious situation, uh, except maybe years and years ago. But uh, let's let's uh, keep our leaders of all lands deeply in our prayer. Oh, I'm sorry, Cheryl, go right ahead. Christy continues, remains in the hospital, still in the hospital, and uh, needs our prayers right now. So thank you for lifting that up. Let us, let us turn to God. Dear God, thank you for celebrations and birthdays and times of the church coming together in such wonderful ways, for all of the activities uh, upcoming, <clears throat> from Seder meals uh, to youth ski trips to VBS programs and rummage sales, and the list goes on and on. The choirs return. We just thank you for all of this progress and activity in the life of our church. But we do pray for our members who gather this morning, and there's sadness in their heart because they've lost loved ones. And in some cases, there's fear because they are still struggling with health issues or, or facing upcoming surgeries or have been hospitalized because of struggles they are dealing with. We just pray for all of these, for your presence, for your strength, for your love uh, to especially be known. Dear God, as we enter into this Lenten season come Wednesday, we just pray for a time when truly we can love you more. Whatever that means for each and every one of us in our own way, but just that we can come to that point in our life where we love you more and your love compels us. In whatever way you need to compel us right now, either through our giving or our, uh, our serving our family or meeting the needs of others or deeper in a life of prayer, reading our Bible, whatever is, is needful for each and every one of us, Father, help us to love you more and we pray your love will compel us according to your will and in ways that will further your kingdom. Dear God, we pray uh, for the citizens of Ukraine and for Christians and others in Russia who too have been victimized by the whims and the will of a despotic ruler. Somehow that you would bring about uh, not just a ceasefire but truly a peace that the invasion the horror, the, the horrors of war will somehow cease. And dear we, God, we pray for our president and for the rulers of all nations and especially for the rulers of all lands who love freedom and, and seek for peace, that you would give them wisdom and discernment in their response. Help us to be faithful in our prayers and Help us to trust in you, knowing that you will see us through as a global community, through Christ our Lord. For, Lord, it is in his name that we pray, even as he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As our ushers come forward, let us continue in prayer. Dear God, help us to be faithful and generous in the giving of our tithes and offerings and help us always be wise in the use of these monies for the furthering of your kingdom through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Our hymn of commitments, number 462, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." We'll do verses 1 through 4. While we're singing this, if you want to just come for a moment of prayer, you're welcome. If you feel led to come and profess your faith in Christ, we invite you. If you're ready to make this church your home, uh, you're welcome to come during this verse, and we will receive you. Number 462. Imposition of the ashes just shortly after noon. We'll be meeting in the chapel. And then at 6 o'clock, it'll be about 20 minutes, about a 20 minute service, just devotion, scripture, uh, the imposition of the ashes, and a song as we begin this Lenten journey. And now may the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. <laughs> 